me put the record. Okay, all right, so um, let's get started with Boober. So, um, so just to answer some of your questions with regards again to the fragmented, right, character of his work. Um, in, in, we're entering in the 20th century, first of all, like I said, a, a broken world, right? There's, there is the sense that things aren't clear anymore. There is no clear direction. We don't know really anymore where we're going. We're not so sure of ourselves and confident of ourselves. We have lost the sense of optimism in what humankind can do. And so you have these, this kind of fragmented writing everywhere in the 20th century. Everybody is writing like this, right? And we're going to see rigorize the same. Other philosophers are all writing like this, right? So, so that's the first reason. But there's another reason why he chooses to write like this. And you find this also in the writings of Marcel Levinas, whom you don't know, <laughs> but maybe one day you will. And this is because of the topic he's dealing with, right? He's talking about um a mysterious dimension of what it means to be human which is the you right what does it mean to the, he's talking about the sacred dimension what it means to be human and when you when you enter into that realm right this mysterious realm of what it means to be human what is this sacred uh, space that inhabits us you can't be clear you can't have arguments you can only give a glimpse into that dimension right so this is a second reason why Buber writes in the way he does, kind of only, he only, ha he has the humility to realize that he can only give us glimpses of this dimension. He can't take out a telescope or a microscope and be like, ah, here, here's what it means to be with a human being. Here's what a human being is. Here's what is the you, right? You can't do that. You, you, this, is a, this is a dimension which remains hidden. It's, 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 um, it's part of the mysterious essence of being human, right? So you can't be clear and you can't be, um, what's the word? You can't make an argument about this dimension because it's a mysterious dimension which surpasses our understanding. So all you can do and all he has the humility to do is give us glimpses. And so he just gives us a little snapshot here, a little snapshot there, and that's all he can do, right? Okay, does that clarify for the style? Just so you, any, any other questions about the way he's writing? Have I responded um, to your concerns? <laughs> Okay, good. All right, so let's get into the text. Today we're going to, to delve deeper into the IU relationship, but first let's, um, let's remind ourselves what we were talking about, right? The main idea in I and Dao is the notion that we are losing as a society uh, the sense of what it means to be human. Okay, so make sure you write this down that this is really what he's addressing in the book. He, he's responding to a culture, to a society, to a political context, where we are losing the sense of what it means to be human. Okay, so we are, we have reduced human beings to objects that we can use and discard. Human beings have a value only in as much as they are productive and useful. Uh, we consider human beings as disposable, as exploitable, right? And today, especially, right, we are still in this context that Buber is responding to and that Buber is warning us against. We're losing the sense of what it means to be human. And we're going to see towards the end of today that in losing the sense of the humanity of the other person, we are also losing our own humanity. It's connected, right? So this is new. Kant didn't talk about that, right? Kant just talked about respect and the sacred boundaries, right, of the other that I cannot use or discard. But Buber is going to go much more deeper, deeply now into what it means to, um, to be aware, to recognize, to protect, right, this dimension of the human being that we are forgetting um, this dimension. We are forgetting what it means to be with a human being, right? And even just to remind you, right, even in our dating um, uh, culture, right, we are ghosting each other, <laughs> we are, right, we, we start something and then we just disappear, <laughs> or, you know, we start something and then we don't, we kind of, you know, kind of discard when it's not working out, uh, or we use 
ruthlessly <laughs> the other person, right? For one night, for one month, for a summer vacation, right? We are in that culture that Uber is addressing. We are the, really the target audience here, right? So, and in doing so, Uber is saying we're missing <laughs> the fundamental, right? About what it means to be human. So, so this is what he means, of course, by the first sentence, right? That um, I think Gonzalez, was that, <laughs> that Gonzalez uh, brought up, right? Um, so if you can turn to page uh, 53, right, we have, um, he's leading us into his, his theme, uh, top line of page 53. Are you there? The world is twofold. Say yes if you're there. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay, great. Yes. yes. Okay, okay, I got you, I got you. <laughs> okay, so he's saying this, right? The world is twofold for man in according with his twofold attitude. In other words, um, there is two ways that we engage with the world or that we ought to engage in the world, right? The first one he calls the I it, right? And let me just put that in the chat again so we can re remember these concepts, right? And the second, Okay, um, let me write to everybody. It's something I usually forget to do. And the second concept is the I, you, or I, thou, right? Same thing, they mean the same, right? So these are the two ways that we ought to engage with the world, but according to Buber, most of us have reduced our um, engagement with the world to an I, it relationship. Everything for us is an I, it relationship. And we'll talk a little briefly about what that means, right? But we already know, I think, from Kant. Right? And Buber is saying, no, we ought to broaden, we ought to make sure there is a difference between how we treat objects and how we treat human beings. We are missing out on the second attitude. We have forgotten this attitude, which is the attitude of the I, you. Okay, so uh, let's briefly talk about the I, it, and then what we're going to do is explore the I, you together on page uh, 55. And remember the, uh, what I told you in the introduction, we are going to proceed together this time. So you're going to have to be a little bit more proactive today in the class because we're going to do just like we did for Rumi. We're going to, because these are riddles, because this is poetic writing, we need to uh, interpret it together, right? We, because everyone will see a different facet. Uh, each sentence is a universe that has several angles right, that, and facets that only together we can see the whole picture. So we're going to be working together today to explore the IU. So brace yourselves, I'm going to call on you. Um, now, let's briefly talk about the I it. It's not much to talk about. Um, it's enough to remember Kant. What does it mean to treat someone as an it? There are two things that I keep on talking about. See if you remember from Kant, right? Same idea. I'm listening. Okay, very good, right? Korelashvili, using somebody, right? This is when, just like, you know, I use this glass of water for my purposes. The glass of water has no other purpose but to please me, right? It doesn't have any uh, existence or importance of its own. And when I'm done with it, I can discard it, right? So this is how, this is the typical I it relationship, right? Pour water, yes, Ben. <laughs> right. So make sure you jot this down, right? That the I it is treating someone like an object, meaning you use and you discard. We saw this already with Kant. We're down with that. We understand it. That there's no problem there. What, what we need to now explore together is the I-U relationship or the I-Thou relationship. And we're going to see that although his starting point is Kant, right, he starts with similar view as Kant, he's going to go much deeper. He's going to give us a much fuller picture of what it means to be with a human being. Okay, so let's go to page 55. Top of page 55, I'm going to focus on that paragraph right there. And remember, I'm going to be re relying on your interpretations. So, so let's begin. I'll read the first sentence, right? Uh, everybody's there. Whoever says you does not have something, say yes, somebody. Yes. Okay, great. Whoever says you, this is the first uh, entry point, right? First definition, whoever says you does not have something for his object. Okay, this one is basic. What does it mean? <clears throat> Do not have something for an object. What is he saying? When you're treating someone like a you, 
it means you don't have them like an object. What is he saying? You see them as a person, they're not just a thing. When, okay. you, when you talk to them exactly. like that. Very good, basic, right? Basic Kant, Kant 101. Uh, it's not even, I don't know if it's even treating them like, it's not, it's not even that far, <laughs> right? It's just basic, an object you use, you discard to see someone as a you, is to hold back from treating them as an object. Now, this is interesting because let me just open a parenthesis because what he's saying is that there are things we can't see in this life if we don't have the proper attitude. In other words, if you're using someone, you're going to be blinded to their you-ness, to their sacredness. The moment you abstain from using someone is the moment somehow your eyes will open. So this is interesting because here we have a definition of knowledge as an embodied action. There are certain things we can't understand or see if we don't do. By the way, this is a very Jewish concept, right? Let me just open, do a little parenthesis on, on Jewish uh, concept of, of knowledge, because this will help you understand what's going on here on a deeper level. Um, there's, there's a beautiful story, actually it's not a beautiful story, it's in the, it's in the Hebrew Bible, <laughs> right? If, if you recall that story when the Hebrews were gathered around the Mount Sinai to receive the law, right? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because there's a mistranslation there which ruins everything. <laughs> uh, the, the Hebrews received the law and then the text says, or the text is translated as saying, uh, we will uh, understand and then we will do, right? So we, we will understand the law, we will figure it out and then we will practice it, right? Actually, in the Hebrew is not what is written. In the Hebrew it says, we will do, and then we will understand. This is very profound. In other words, there are certain things you can't understand unless you do them. This is the essence of spiritual truth. You can't understand a given religion, a given spiritual path, uh, a given uh, spiritual, unless you do, you practice, unless you do it, right? So this is what Buber is saying. Unless we refrain from using, we can't see this dimension. We remain blinded. We remain short-sighted, right? So there, there are things you can't see until you do, right? So this is just to go a little deeper, right, into what he's doing, that, that there, there is a certain approach, stance, behavior that is needed on our part for us to be able to discern the dimension of the you. It's not intellectual. You see it by doing. As you refrain from using someone, it's somehow your brain becomes enlarged and you see that dimension that you didn't see before, right? Okay, I'll give you an example of that um, in my own life, but it's nothing to do here with, with Ayn Dao, but um, it's a shameless plug for veganism. <laughs> I apologize. I don't want to be like one of those vegans. But um, before I became a vegan, I didn't give a damn about animals. Okay? They were there to serve us and you know, to be eaten. <laughs> so, but then I became a vegan, not for animal rights reasons. I became a vegan just because I wanted to lose weight I, for health reasons. As I, <laughs> go figure, right? As I became, so I became, I became, I started to eat in that way. I, I, I started to eat several months into a year. Now it's been a few years. As I became a vegan, as something started, a sensitivity started to develop in me where now I am much more sensitive to the plight of animals than I ever was. And this did, this wasn't intellectual. This was, I shifted my behavior and in doing so, my mind shifted, right? So this is just an, an example of what Buber is saying here. Okay. We've said too much on this. <laughs> all right, let's go into the second one. Um, all right, uh, just going down a few lines. The you, he says, um, has no borders. So this one is an interesting one that we need to take time to explore. He's saying to see someone as a you is to see them without borders. Okay, so the question is, what does it mean to put a border on someone? And what does it mean to take off the border? All right, I'm listening. <laughs> um, so would be so be, would be so would putting a border on someone like limit their freedom and limit themselves, and by removing that border, you're allowing them to completely embrace their trueness and their own personality. Okay, very good. Let's do number one. Okay, so this is Ben's interpretation. It's correct, <laughs> right? To put a border on someone is, for example, to take away their agency to take away their um, individuality, 
to not let them be themselves. They can't be free to think what they want to think, to do what they want to do. When you do this, you lose the you, right? You're with an it. So in one way to, to um, find yourself in the presence of the you, one way to become aware of the you is to abstain from setting limits on the other human being, whether it's taking away their agency, not allowing them to be themselves. Okay, very good, this is a good one. Again, you raised your hand, tell us. <clears throat> um, I would say that putting a border on someone is, uh, when you put up a border, it's kind of like you're separating what you do accept about them and what you don't. And when you take the border away, you're allowing them to, like Ben said, allowing them to freely be who they, who they are and accepting everything about them, even the things that you don't like and don't agree with. Okay, good, good. This is a variation on what Ben said, right? This is the ability to not uh, um, reduce them to what you want them to be. That's one, so let's take the second, right, interpretation by Ayen. One of the ways we put borders on people is we, we tell them, you can only be this. We, we reduce them to what we think they should be and everything else they can't be, <laughs> right? So this is, right, this way of reducing someone to who we think they should be, and parents do that a lot, right? Also, romantic partners do that, right? You can't do this, like, you know, I'm not comfortable with you doing this, <laughs> right? And, and when you're doing that, you are, right, a capturing them into your own version of themselves, right? And this is putting a border, taking out this notion that I, I think you should be like this and letting them grow into who they were meant to be is a way to recognize their you, right? Very good. Koralashvili, let's see what you have to say. Uh, border is seeing someone as only one thing or way and no border is seeing, ah, what you prescribe them. Okay, very good, right? So as, so let's add this, what Koralashvili said, right? Is to see someone in one way and missing out on all the other ways that they could be. So let's go a little deeper in that one. How are some ways that we see people in just one way and we miss the complexity? <clears throat> see if you can develop this. We judge on the exterior. Okay, good, that's one way, right? We judge on the exterior. We see, for example, a gender, we see a race, we see social background and boom, we have <laughs> locked them up into something that we think, right, they belong to. So racism, by the way, sexism, these are all ways to miss the you, right? When you say, when you reduce someone to your perception of their race, right? It's not, re you can't reduce someone to their race, but you can reduce them to your perception of what that race is. <laughs> or when re you reduce someone to your perception of what their gender is, you are limiting them you are making them small, you are reducing them, you are, <laughs> what's this? <laughs> you are, um, I can't find the word, but I think Shrinking. What? Shrinking. Shrinking them, thank you, I like that. You're shrinking them down to this narrow perception you have and you're seeing them based on these labels that have grown in, in in your own mind right so so maybe you, you can write this down this is very important labeling people based on their race or their gender or their sexual orientation is a way to miss the you right and we are very good at labeling people right we in, in fact it's a natural thing that we do right we see someone who's Chinese or Mexican and we have already a whole set of assumptions what kind of person they are <laughs> right inevitable Right. This is, by the way, this is inevitable. I want to emphasize this. There is a very famous author right now, African American author called George Yancey, which I suggest you look into if you're interested in the philosophy of race. And he has written several essays and books on how we are all, whether we like it or not, we are all racist. <laughs> Everybody, no matter what your race is, because we live in a racist society, he says, because we drink racism in the mother's milk, right? Because we grow up hearing stereotypes, hearing stories about the other races, we can't help it. We are all, first reflex is always going to be a racist one. And he says, nobody can escape this. He goes further to explain that first point by saying, as a man, I'm always sexist, he says, because I have been, 
conditioned to see women in a certain way because of how society has raised me right and so it, it, what Buber is saying is that we are all he's not saying that but <laughs> George Yancey is saying we are all racist we are all sexist and what Buber is saying we have to make the effort continuously to take off these borders that we set on people right it's inevitable that we are going to put borders on people right based on their race gender orientation and what Buber is saying is to recover the you to come back into contact with the you we have to learn to continuously undo these stereotypes in our minds right uh, so very good yes anything else anybody else has um there's one you have missed a little bit that you could get from Kierkegaard we studied Kierkegaard a couple weeks ago uh he has a whole he, he he has a version of this. Hmm. Before I mention the Kierkegaard one, anyone else want to try interpreting the you has no borders? Okay, let me remind you of the Kierkegaard one and see if you can find it. Um, Kierkegaard talks about hope, remember? What is hope and how is it connected to what Buber is saying here? Let's see if you remember. So hope is a matter of just hoping for the others, like well-being, hoping that they could get to a point of being happy again. Okay. Uh, and how is that idea of hope connected to uh, taking off a border? Uh, or you should ask yourself the opposite. What is despair and how is despair a putting on of borders and hope taking off of those borders? Well, yeah, uh, Ben, well, put, put your picture. I want to see you. <laughs> I'm gonna get my picture. <laughs> so, wait, give me a sec. Um, so would that mean that when you just have hate for someone or no longer trust them, that's what limits your view of them, which is the putting of borders around them? Yeah, however, yeah. the moment you begin to hope for them, you begin to see more possibilities of ways they could flourish, which opens up the Excellent, excellent, very good, right? To despair of someone is to tell yourself that person is never going to change. That's who they are, that's who they're always going to be, and boom, you have, you have encapsulated, you have, a, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, yeah, yeah, you have restricted them, you have, what is it when you put someone in captivity, you have enslaved, no, it's not that, I, I can't find the word, but yeah, it's the idea, right? Confine. Confine them, yes, you can say that, into this perspective you have of them, yeah, he's always going to be a cheater. Yeah, she's always going to be a gossip, or he's always going to be poor, or she's always going to be arrogant, right? So when we despair of someone, boom, you have locked them into this perception, and you are missing everything else they could be, everything they could become. Remember, according to Kierkegaard, there is a 50% chance that the other can switch, can flip, either in good or bad, by the way, right? Kierkegaard is realistic. He says there's always a 50% chance that the best person becomes the worst person, but there's always a 50% chance that the worst person becomes the best person, right? That's what we read in Works of Love, right? This is what Buber is talking about. To refuse to despair of someone, to continuously hope and see all the possibilities of what they could be is a way to take off the borders, to free them right, from their past misdeeds and from your grudges and from your resentment, right, you're taking off the borders. Very good, right? So, so this is such amazing, right? And, and by the way, when you don't do that, you don't see that dimension. You remain short-sighted, right? To continuously put on borders, in a way, you remain in ignorance of the dimension of the Tao. You miss this whole dimension of humanity. You don't see it right? Unless you force yourself to do these things, right? The Tao is not something you can see by sitting back and being like, oh yeah, there, I see it, right? No, you can only see it when you perform certain actions. Make sure you write this down, right? The dimension of the you, you can't perceive it sitting in your chair and looking at someone, right? You can't see it like that. The only way you see the you, that dimension, is by doing certain things, right? by not treating something as an, uh, someone as an object or by taking off the borders continuously from how you see them. As you do these things, you will begin to see 
more deeply into what it means to be human, right? Any questions so far before we go to the last section of this paragraph? <clears throat> okay, so let's go to the third one here. Whoever says you does not have something, he has nothing. Okay, what does this mean? What does it mean that you have nothing in a relationship? Where? Uh, the last sentence of that paragraph on 55. Oh. Whoever, whoever says you does not have something, he has nothing. What does it mean that you have nothing in a relationship? That doesn't sound too cheerful. Uh, what, what does he mean here? It sounds like when he says that there's, they, because then he says, but he stands in relation. It sounds as though you're not, when you talk to someone as a person, you're not having, you're not talking to them with expectation. You have nothing. You're not looking for anything to gain when you're talking to someone in relation with one another. You're not looking for anything. Excellent, excellent, right? Remember Rumi, no expectations, right? When you're, when you're really connecting with someone, you're not about what they can give you. You're just connecting for the joy of connecting, right? You, you're not about what you can get from them, what you can gain from them. You're not trying to possess them. You're just enjoying their presence, right? And in doing so, you are entering the dimension of relationship versus the dimension of, right, objectification, right? So very good, uh, Rivera, you got it. Okay, now I'm going to add a couple more quotes from different uh, pages. I'm going to go to page 62. There's a few more, couple more quotes. There's a very good paragraph on 62, the top of 62. This is a beautiful one which should remind you of Rumi. Uh, let's see if you're all there. The you encounters me by grace. Are you there? Uh, so yeah. yeah. Okay, very good. Right, page 62, the top. The you encounters me by grace. It cannot be found by seeking. Okay, what is he saying there? Especially with regards to romantic relationships. If you want an IU romantic relationship, what should you not do? <laughs> uh, he's basically saying if you keep searching for the perfect thing, you're never going to find it because no one is like born perfect. However, if you start off with, you know, someone you at least have care for, it could slowly build into something that you are looking for. So you're right about what you said, but how does it connect to what he, does it connect exactly with what he's saying? The UN counters me by grace. It cannot be found by seeking. He's not. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, the grace thing is like I said, the whole going about it slowly, you and the person making something and the seeking is like looking for the perfect thing. Okay, good. All right, so we can say this. Let's add Ben's interpretation, right? It cannot be found by seeking. When you're trying to seek with certain aspect, because that's what seeking is. Seeking, you have an idea, what you want, and now you're seeking, right? So this is, according to Buber, this is the wrong way to go about it. If you have an, a preordained idea how the person should be and how the relationship should be, and you're seeking that into the world, you're going to miss the you, right? You're going to miss the relationship, right? Very good. Any other way to understand this? Um, I think you should be reminded of Rumi. Rumi talks about this. Um, in one of the first poems we did when he talks about midnight, right? As the time when the beloved comes and visits. Can anyone make the connection between that poem? Midnight, the, my friend is... is oh, um, he's, it's um, that your beloved comes when you're not looking, when you... It's if you're seeking, right? I guess if, if you're, your beloved comes when you're not looking for it, I guess, or yeah, something like that. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, uh, added to this, right, Koralashvili, the person will come to you. Uh, Burkova, things will come to you when you don't seek them with expectations. This is the case with the IU. The IU, you cannot force it, you can't make it happen, you can't coerce the relationship. It comes to you, right? There is an element of powerlessness letting go in the IU relationship that you don't have in the I it relationship. The I it is the hookup. Hookup, you can go, you will find. Believe me, <laughs> I'll hook you up if you want. <laughs> it's easy, right? So a hookup is easy to go out, seek, and find. But a but a IU relationship, that's more. That's that's another dimension. Right, this, this is happening on another level. And on that level, we have to, in a way, shift the way we 
approach the situation. We are go-getters in this culture. Remember, we talked about this. We are always thinking, I got to go get this. I got to make this happen, right? And this works on many, many levels, right? But not on the level of romantic relationships, right? In the romantic relationship, you have to allow rather than get, right? And so this is how you know you're with a you because the you entered your life rather than you made it happen, right? So that's, that's, there is a grace element in every IU relationship. There is something that you did not cause. It happened to you, right? You're not making it happen, manipulating the events, right? So this is um, the advice, right? Both Rumi and Buber agree on this, that when it comes to romantic relationships, we have to learn to receive, to allow, rather than to grasp and to force or strive, right? This is um, very good. Last one. Now, here we go to, in my view, the climax, the contribution of Buber. Go to the last sentence or next to the last sentence in that paragraph on page 62. And this is very much like a riddle, right? He says, this I require a you to become, becoming I, I say you. Okay. Wait, which but, part? Oh, no. Uh, almost next to last sentence on the first paragraph of 62. Okay. Everybody sees it? I require a you to become, becoming I, I say you. All right, who wants to do a wild guess as to what he's talking about here? <laughs> I think what he's saying with this is like, in order to become, I think he's talking about humanity and in order to become a full on human being, you need to respect and see the life of another human being because you are, the way you treat another person is a reflection of how you are as a person and how you are via humanity, like how, like the hum, like how much humanity you have as a human being. Okay, you said it so well. <laughs> That's it, right? I hope you guys took notes. Uh, let, me, let me try and summarize what Rivera just said, right? We, we, it, it's for Buber beyond Kant, right? He's not just talking about protecting the humanity in another human being. He's saying the, the fact that you're able to protect the humanity in another human being is reflecting on your level of humanity. In other words, you can't become fully human if you're not capable of protecting another human being, right? So your humanity, your own humanity, your own human depth is dependent on how you treat other human beings. And so if you miss the IU, in a way, you're remaining stunted in your own humanity, right? And this is so fundamental. I mean, I wish we would understand this because we have um, an attitude in this country that um, other people's problems aren't our business, <laughs> right? So we think, well, okay, they're suffering over there, but how does it concern me, right? Uh, or, you know, they're you know, we have this uh, immigration problem or these people on welfare or this over here, right? And this, this doesn't concern me. Everyone to their own, right? This is the American dream. Everyone should do their own thing, right? They have all the opportunities they need, right? We don't realize, I think, as a society, how deeply we are losing our own humanity when we remain indifferent to the humanity of others, right? And this is on a personal level, but also on a collective level. We are in danger, I believe, today in our country where we have become calloused, insensitive, indifferent to the suffering of others. And we're saying it's not my problem, but we're, we're forgetting that when, we, when it's not our problem, we are ourselves losing right? We're losing our own humanity. So this is very, very, this is a step ahead of Kant, right? Basically, he's saying, if you can't recognize the humanity of another human being, if you cannot protect their human being, if you are incapable of IU relationships, you yourself will remain stunted in your own human blossoming, right? You will miss out, <laughs> right? Each time you're racist, each time you're sexist, each time you despair on someone, each time you take away someone's agency, right? Any moment, each time you show indifference, right? To another human person's value apart from their use, <laughs> right? You are in a way, narrowing your own self. You are stunting your own self. It's not only the other that is suffering, it's you, right? So in a way, um, 
one has to be sorry for both the racist person and the person who is victim of racism, right? This is something that, um, actually, I have some time, I can tell you a little bit, um, um, a story about this, this issue of racism, but in a way, right, the racist person is as demeaned as the person who is a victim of their racism. They themselves are losing their own humanity. There is no benefit to the racist on the human level <laughs> for his racism. Let me tell you a little bit, just to illustrate this, um, what happened in South Africa with regards to racism, how they addressed the topic how, of racism. Um, you're all familiar with, um, uh, what was it called? Apartheid. Apartheid. So yeah, apartheid. But then there was the Truth and Reconciliation. Truth and Re Commission. Reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah. So let me write this down. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So let me talk a little bit about that, right? So when Mandela came to power, um, and and uh, the, the black minority or majority, <laughs> what am I saying? The black majority uh, had the power in the country. Uh, obviously, they had to create a context where whoever had perpetrated crimes needed to be uh, disciplined or punished, right? So when Mandela came to power, he realized if we start putting everyone in jail <laughs> who committed crimes against the black population, a third of the country will be in jail, <laughs> right? So they, they realized we, we can't work in this way. This is a European model. We're going to do things African style around here. Right? And so they realized we're going to address the problem of racism and the crimes um, that we have endured by racists, right? by the racist government and, and elites of South Africa. We're going to address this differently. And they formed the, the commission, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, Mandela, also the bishop, uh, Desmond Tutu, was a part of that. Right? These are all very well-known names around that. Uh, framework. So their issue was this. They decided that, um, uh, so uh, they decided to rely on African worldview, African wisdom to deal with the problem of racism and to address it, right? And so they, 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 they turned to a very uh, important concept in, um, in South African language and worldview called Ubuntu. Okay, so this is the African concept, philosophical concept, and the meaning of it is this. Uh, I am me if you are you, or I am happy if you're happy, or I am free if you're free. In other words, what happens to you has repercussions on me. If you're not free, I'm not free. If you're not happy, I'm not happy. Right? We are connected. This is a very different worldview than the European worldview where I can be happy and you can be miserable over there and it doesn't affect me, but it does. Right? That's what the African worldview is saying. It will still, the misery of the other people will affect me in a kind of <clears throat> underhanded way. I'm going to be affected by this. We are connected. We cannot just say I'm here and you're there. Right? We live in an interconnected world. So if you're not free, I'm really not free. If you're not happy, I'm not happy. And so they applied this view, this perspective on racism. And they said, as long as you, uh, let me frame it differently. We, they realized we cannot be truly free from the yoke of racism imposed on us until the racist is free from his or her racism. In other words, it's not just a question of punishing the racists, right? It's a question of freeing them. Because as long as they're not free, I'm not truly free. Even if we put them all in jail, even if we execute them, if we have not freed them profoundly, spiritually of their racism, we will never be truly free from this image they have set upon us, right? So it's a very profound idea that I cannot become myself if you don't become yourself. This was the idea that the black population can never be truly free unless the white population frees itself also spiritually, psychologically from this perspective, right? So the idea was that they were not going to punish anybody, but they would have mass televised confessions where the racists, right, the, the crimes, the racist, the criminals who had committed racist acts would come in front of the whole country on TV and repent, <laughs> free themselves, right? So 
whether it worked or not, I don't know, but the idea is a very Buberian idea. The idea that they, uh, it's very close. I mean, it, it always amazes me how close Hebrew thought is to African thought. There are a lot of connections, right? When Buber is saying, I require a you to become, he's saying, unless you're free, I'm not free. If I free you, then I am free myself, right? By freeing you, I free myself. So they wanted to not only punish or, um, you know, discipline the, the criminals, racist criminals, they wanted to free them on a deep level from this perverted perspective. And in doing so, they were creating their own freedom, right? This is really one of the best illustrations of what Buber is saying, right? I can never be fully myself if you are not fully yourself, right? So as long as I am oppressing you, I am actually oppressing myself, right? On a metaphysical, spiritual level. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? Yeah. Ben, you have a question? No, I saying I agree. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any other comments or questions before I conclude? <laughs> Okay, so next time we're going to study the IU in the context of romantic relationships. And we're going to talk about the redemption of marriage, right? Marriage is in a crisis right now. There is like 60% divorce. So this is going to be very useful information for you. How can I apply these Buberian concepts, right? The IU relationship, how can I apply this to my marriage? You will thank me in, in uh, 30 years when your marriage starts to hit the rocks. <laughs> you have to go back to this text because I believe he, there is a key there as to how to renew our romantic relationships. Uh, this concept of IU is actually very, very powerful when it comes to renewing a relationship. Okay, so next time I see you is going to be April 28, which is what, next week? I think so. When exactly? I'm checking to make sure we're on Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, next Tuesday. Very good. Okay, good. So you have a, a nice weekend. You can finish reading Boober. Uh, you have time. <laughs> I will see you guys next Tuesday. If anybody still has a question, you can stay behind. Otherwise, the rest of you can go. <laughs> <laughs>